Now we will begin today's webinar on returning to work. My name is Madison McMahon Ward, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Joanna Morales. Joanna is a cancer rights attorney, founder and CEO of Triage Cancer. She has spent, Ms. Morales has spent decades providing resources and help to individuals diagnosed with cancer. And she has provided nearly a thousand educational seminars on health insurance, employment, estate planning, and much more. She co-authored a book called Cancer Rights Law, an Interdisciplinary Approach. And if you'd like to read more about Joanna on our website, you can feel free to do so. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joanna. Thank you, Madison. So today's webinar on returning to work is going to cover the key laws that come up most often for someone who is returning to work. And that includes understanding both the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Family and Medical Leave Act. But the laws and benefits and protections that might be available to someone are going to depend on whether or not someone is returning to a current job or if you're returning to a new job. And then at the end of the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about transitioning off of Social Security disability benefits because there are some key programs that can help you return to work after being on disability insurance. Now, when we're talking about employment rights, there are a lot of places to go for information about your employment rights. There are laws that we refer to as fair employment laws, which include protections against discrimination for employees based on their medical condition and their status as caregivers. It also includes access to reasonable accommodation, and we're going to talk more about what those are. But those fair employment laws exist at the federal level like the ADA, but they also exist at the state level in most states. And so it's a good example of where it's important to not just know what's available to you at the federal level, but to also know what's available to you at the state level. And then there are laws that we refer to as leave laws, which allow us to take time off work and give us some protections like job protection, and in some cases, health insurance protection. And those again exist at the federal level, like the Family and Medical Leave Act or the FMLA. And they also exist at the state level and maybe even at the county or city level. And then if you work under an employment contract or you're a member of a union, those contracts are gonna provide additional information about what you have access to at work. So the benefits and protections that are available to you to tap into if you're returning to work. We often forget that the law just provides a bare minimum of what employers have to do. And there are many employers that go above and beyond what the law requires them to. So they might provide additional employee benefits and protections that are important to understand if you're looking to go back to work. And those benefits can include things like your health and dental and vision insurance, but they might also offer you a disability policy or life insurance. And if you're returning to work or you're returning to a new job, these are things that you wanna be paying attention to. And we're gonna talk more about this as we move forward. But your employer policies might also govern how you took time off of work which also might speak to how they're going to handle you returning to work, uh, how much vacation time or sick time you have available to you, different ways that they accrue that time. Do you have access to flex time or telecommuting that can help you transition back into the workplace? All of those things are gonna be specific to your employer and your job responsibilities. And you can usually find uh, all of these policies in some version of an employee handbook or manual um, or some type of policies and procedures document. But if you don't have that at your workplace, you can ask questions about these benefits, uh, typically of someone who handles benefits. So is there a person that you turn in your timesheets to, or is there a person who handles the health insurance benefits? Um, or even an administrator 
who might be able to answer some of these questions for you if it's not written in a document. So turning to the legal protections, we're gonna start with the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. And most people are familiar with the ADA because of its accessibility protections, like having uh, ramps into buildings for individuals who use wheelchairs or accessible parking spots or bathrooms. But there's an entire section of the ADA that we call Title I. And Title I specifically focuses on the employment of people with disabilities. And Title I of the ADA is enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, the federal agency that makes sure employers are complying with the ADA. So in order to use the ADA's protections, you have to meet some requirements. And the first is that you work for a private employer with 15 or more employees, or you work for a state or local government. Federal employees actually aren't covered by the ADA, but they are covered by the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And the protections that I'm going to talk about are the same under the Rehab Act. So you also have to be qualified for the job. And to be qualified means that you can perform the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation. And then the third requirement is that you actually have a disability under the ADA's definition of disability. So it's important to realize that all the laws and programs that we talk about actually have different definitions of disability. So the ADA defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So there's a few parts to that. So first you have to have a physical or mental condition and it's having an impact on a major life activity. And that impact has to be substantial. So it can't be something minor or something that just happens once in a while. It has to be a substantial limit on a major life activity. So what's a major life activity? Those are things like eating, breathing, walking, talking, concentrating, sleeping, and the operation of major, major bodily function. All things that are commonly impacted by cancer treatment that would substantially impact, be impacted. So generally speaking, someone with a cancer diagnosis doesn't have a hard time qualifying as have, having a disability under the ADA. Now, once you've shown that you work for the right employer and that you're qualified for the job and that you have a disability under the ADA, there's four ways that you can actually use the ADA's protections. And the first is that you currently have that medical condition that substantially impacts a major life activity. The second is that you have a history of having that medical condition. And this is really useful for someone who is going back into the workforce and is concerned about being treated differently because of a cancer diagnosis in the past. Uh, and that is where the ADA steps in and provides protection. So if you are returning to a new employer, you have some protections under the ADA. There is also what we call the regarded as prong of the ADA. And this really isn't about you at all. This is about your employer's perception of you. So your employer is regarding you as having a disability and is treating you differently because of their own perceptions. So that's enough for protection under the ADA. And then the last way that you can use the ADA's protections is actually for caregivers. So there is a line in the ADA that says people who associate with a person with a disability are protected against discrimination in the workplace. So caregivers, based on their caregiving status and how they associate with a person with a disability, are protected against discrimination based on the fact that they're a caregiver. And that can also be very helpful. Now, the ADA applies to all phases of the employment process. So that means that job applicants are protected all the way through the employment process. And really the bottom line of the ADA's discrimination protections are that an employer can't make an employment decision based on your medical information. And those employment decisions are things like, should I hire you or should I fire you or should I give you a promotion or should I give you special benefits or give you the next new project that we're taking on. 
So any of those employment decisions shouldn't take into consideration your medical condition and you shouldn't be treated differently because of that medical condition. So besides those protections against discrimination, the ADA also gives you access to reasonable accommodations. And reasonable accommodations are defined as any change in the work environment or in the way things are customarily done that enable an individual with a disability to enjoy equal employment opportunities. So that's the legal definition of a reasonable accommodation. But practically speaking, a reasonable accommodation could be anything that could potentially help an individual either stay at work, return to work, or even potentially take time off of work that is reasonable based on their job responsibilities and their workplace. So to give you some examples, practically speaking, of what accommodations could look like, especially in the context of a cancer diagnosis, it might be about adjusting your workspace. So maybe telecommuting is an option, whether that means working from home or maybe working from another location. Like, could you work from an infusion room? Or could you work at a location that is actually closer to your home so that your commute is less? Uh, it could also be about adjusting schedule. So could there be a change in your hours to work those hours around your treatment schedule or follow-up medical appointments? Could you get access to additional breaks if you're experiencing long-term fatigue when you return to work? Um, or maybe it's even using technology that actually helps you continue to do your job and be able to return to the workplace. There are also options for changing policies. So if uh, an employer has a policy that is making it more difficult for you to do your job, there's the potential where you could ask for an exception to that policy to continue to work or return to your job. It might also be shifting job responsibilities. So we often have that line on our job description that says other duties as assigned. And we tend to pick up things along the way that we become responsible for, but that aren't necessarily essential functions of our job. And so if you have become responsible for some of those things, maybe you could shift those responsibilities to someone else to be able to return to work. So for example, if you are an elementary school teacher and besides teaching in the classroom, you're also responsible for supervising recess or being available at pick up and drop off. Maybe those responsibilities could be shifted to somebody else so that you could focus your energy on being able to teach in the classroom. And then kind of as an accommodation of last resort, if there aren't other available reasonable accommodations, perhaps you might want to actually change your job. And if there's an open job available at your workplace that you're returning to, you could potentially ask to move to that position as a reasonable accommodation. But it's important to realize that the law doesn't require the employer to create a new position for you. It's just a potential accommodation if there's an open position for you. But I will also say there are many employers that are willing to restructure jobs and job responsibilities around the needs of their employees. So it doesn't hurt to potentially ask for that as an accommodation. Oftentimes when I'm talking to patients about reasonable accommodations, people feel like they're asking their employer for a favor when asking for some of these accommodations. And it's important to realize that an employer is required to provide an accommodation if you're eligible for it, unless it poses an undue hardship for the employer or a direct threat. And those are kind of high standards to meet. So when we're talking about undue hardship, it really has to be a significant difficulty or expense for the employer to provide that accommodation. And for direct threat, it has to be a situation where it, giving you the accommodation would put you or other people in harm's way. So those are very high standards to meet. But even though employers have to accommodate you, it still has to be reasonable and effective. So it has to be reasonable based on your job responsibilities. So if you're an air traffic controller 
you probably can't telecommute that job. You probably have to be present in the air traffic controller tower for that. Uh, so it does have to be reasonable based on what you actually do in your job specifically. And it has to be effective specifically for you. So those accommodations have to be available to help you based on the side effects that you might be experiencing due to your medical condition, and they have to work for you. So it can't just be an accommodation for the sake of providing an accommodation. It has to actually be one that's working to help you return to work or stay at work. Now, it's important to realize that even though caregivers are protected against discrimination, under the EDA, they're not entitled to accommodations. Only the individual with a disability or a history of a disability is entitled to accommodations. So we actually think that accommodations are so important and such an underutilized tool to help people stay at work, return to work, and take time off that we have a number of resources available on accommodations to help you think about what might be available to you based on your job and how to actually have those conversations with employers. So all of those resources can be found on our employment page. But there are a couple of tips that we wanna give you today. And the first is that there is no specific time frame for when you have to ask for an accommodation. But we do recommend that you ask for an accommodation as soon as you realize that you need one. Because if you're struggling to do your job and you think that there's something available that might be able to help you, it's important that you ask for that help instead of trying to struggle through where that actually starts to impact your job performance. Because if you let it start to impact your job performance and you haven't asked for an accommodation, at some point, your employer might actually make a job-related decision like letting you go based on your poor job performance if they don't have any other information as to why your job performance is suffering. There also isn't a magic way that you ask for an accommodation. So you don't have to specifically say I'd like a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. You could just ask for the adjusted schedule. And your employer is supposed to recognize that as a request for an accommodation, but we know that many patients as employees end up having to educate their employers about what their employer's responsibilities are under the law. So it's very helpful if you walk into those conversations making those requests, knowing that you might have to provide some additional information on why you're asking for the accommodation and why they're supposed to provide it to you. And there is a very excellent resource called the Job Accommodation Network, or JAN, which is a program of the U.S. Department of Labor that is specifically set up to help employers and employees navigate the accommodations process. So they can call JAN and get information about what they're supposed to be doing as an employer. But sometimes I think it's actually really helpful where if you're in a situation where you've asked for an accommodation and the employer is pushing back a little bit on that or even just saying no, that it could be helpful to say, you know, I've learned about this resource and maybe we could call them together and learn a little bit more about what might be available to help. And that can sometimes diffuse the conversation a little bit and help them understand what they should be doing, particularly in terms of complying with their obligations under the law. It also has some useful resources to help you understand what types of accommodations are even possible based on specific side effects, based on specific medical conditions. So you can go on the website and kind of search through that resource and get some creative ideas about what types of accommodations might help address your side effects based on the job that you have. There also isn't a specific person under the law that you're required to ask for the accommodation, but it is important that you check your employer's policies because maybe they've laid out a process for how to ask for an accommodation. And if you don't follow that process, then they're not gonna provide the accommodation. So you wanna check that employee handbook or whatever policies you might have access to 
and figure out, are you supposed to start with your supervisor or do you go to HR or is it the owner of the company you're supposed to put the request into? It is important to know that requests must be kept confidential, but there's some limitations on that. So if you do start with your supervisor, your supervisor might say, I actually have to take this to HR uh, to be able to start this process formally. So then HR might be notified or HR might get your request and say, well, based on the accommodation that you're asking for, we actually have to get permission from the owner of the company to be able to give you this accommodation. So there is the potential for information to go up the chain of command, but it really shouldn't go down the chain of command. So for example, if you start with HR and uh, you've asked that your information not be shared with the supervisor, based on the accommodation that you get, HR is allowed to tell your supervisor what accommodation you received, but not about why. So they're not supposed to disclose information about your medical condition to your supervisor if you've asked that it not be shared. And then the thing about accommodations is that it isn't limited to just one. So you might ask for multiple accommodations to address multiple side effects that you're experiencing. And so they can be very flexible to address your needs for staying at work or returning to work. And it's important to acknowledge that your needs can change over time. So you might return to work after a surgery and have specific needs for accommodations. But maybe once you're back at work for a few weeks, you actually start chemotherapy or radiation. And the side effects that you're experiencing from those treatments might be very different than what you experienced with surgery. And so your needs for accommodations could change. It's important to know that your accommodations can change with your needs. So there is something called the interactive process. And this is really just a formal term for talking to your employer about an accommodation. So when you ask for an accommodation from your employer, it triggers this process. And your employer is supposed to engage in a negotiation about what types of accommodations might be possible then to actually implement those accommodations for you and then monitor them. So to make sure that they continue to be effective for you. And then if at any point they stop being effective, you actually start the whole process over again. So this is supposed to be interactive, but what we know is that with some employers, they don't engage in the interactive process. But it's the responsibility of both parties to have that negotiation. So if you go to your employer and say, I'd like a reasonable accommodation, and the employer says no and walks away, they've not engaged in that negotiation. But if you go to the employer and say, well, I'd like to telecommute, and they say, well, we don't think you can telecommute, but we can offer you this shifted schedule. That back and forth coming to a decision about what's going to be an effective accommodation for you is the interactive process. And employees are supposed to engage in that process as well. I mentioned that a lot of employees feel like they're asking for a favor when they ask for an accommodation. I think many employers are also very nervous for their employees to ask for accommodations or think that they're going to be very expensive to provide. And Jan actually does research <clears throat> every year to two years that looks at why employers are looking for information about accommodations and what types of accommodations they're providing. And they find that 56% of all accommodations actually cost nothing at all. And 39% of accommodations just have a one-time cost, typically $500 or less. So it's important to keep that in perspective that most of the time accommodations that could be very helpful to you to return to work actually aren't that big of a deal for the employer to provide to you. And many employers want to provide those accommodations because they want to keep good employees and they want to make sure that you're being able to be productive and attend work. So it's important to keep that in perspective that even if you feel like you're asking for a favor, which you're not, you're actually entitled to accommodations if you're eligible for them. 
that the employer might also have a positive perspective on accommodations as well. So wrapping up the idea of asking for accommodations, it's important to be careful of assumptions about what the employer might or might not be willing to do, but also about what might be available to you as an accommodation. You really have to get the details of what's having an impact on you at work. What are the side effects that you're experiencing that are really making it difficult for you to do your job or return to work? and what types of accommodations could actually address each of those side effects. And you can be as creative as possible when thinking about accommodations as long as they're reasonable, because that legal definition says any change. So that really means that everything is on the table in terms of what might possibly be a reasonable accommodation. And I think that when having these conversations you may not have to put it in writing to ask for the accommodation, but it's helpful to still get it in writing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you get a formal letter laying out your accommodations. It's just some written record of what the employer has agreed to provide you. Because you never know what changes might be coming down the pike. Tomorrow you might have a new supervisor and it could just be helpful to have that record of what's happened so far. So, if you work in an environment where it's normal to communicate by email, then maybe just saying, thanks so much for meeting with me today. I'm glad we were able to come up with X, Y, and Z accommodation. Um, I really appreciate your time and I'll keep you posted on how it's working out. And so at least that's a written record of what you talked about. And if the employer responds saying like, great, thanks, then at least it's an indication that the employer agreed to those things. If the employer responds back and says, wait a minute, that's not at all what we just stopped, talked about, that identifies the lack of communication or being on the same page. And so then you can revisit the conversation to make sure you are on the same page moving forward. It's also important to understand that when you're thinking about reasonable accommodations, there are things that you can ask your employer to help with when trying to address side effects at work, and those are accommodations, but there might also be things that you can do outside of reasonable accommodations that could also help address side effects at work. And those include working with your healthcare team, because if you're experiencing um, pain or fatigue or neuropathy, maybe there are things that your healthcare team can work with you on to help mitigate those side effects. But then there are also just practical things that you could do to try to make work easier for you when you're returning to work. And those could include things like um, using technology and you know whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or a calendar to try to keep track of your assignments. Um, if you're experiencing chemo brain. So there are lots of things that you can do outside of asking for an accommodation, but the accommodation is where you're asking your employer to provide something specifically to help you return to work. Now, I mentioned that the ADA applies to private employers with 15 or more employees, as well as state and local government employees. Most states actually have a state fair employment law that tracks with the ADA. And sometimes those state fair employment laws are actually more protective than the ADA. And one of the ways that they're more protective is that they cover smaller employers. Because if you work for an employer with fewer than 15 employees, you actually aren't entitled to the ADA's Title I protections. So this is a chart that shows you the states that have state fair employment laws that cover smaller employers. So if you're in Indiana, for example, your state fair employment law covers employers with five or more employees. So if you work for an employer between five and 15 employees, you're actually looking at your state law for protection rather than the ADA. And this is another good example of where it's important to not just know the federal law, but to also know the state law, because not only can the state law be more protective, but it might be the only thing you have access to in terms of protection. 
If your state isn't on this list, it just means that the state law is the same as the ADA and applies to private employers with 15 or more employees. So turning to the Family and Medical Leave Act or the FMLA, more people are familiar with the FMLA because there's more reasons you can get access to it as an employee. But even though people really think about the FMLA as a way to take time off, it can also be very helpful if you're returning to work at the same employer. So let's talk about the FMLA for just a minute. The FMLA is enforced by the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division, and it's a federal law that allows employees to take time off for their own serious medical condition or as a caregiver of a spouse, a parent, or a child with a serious medical condition. That is a very limited definition of family member. It's just spouse, parent, or child. So it's not parent-in-law or uh, grandparent or sibling or aunt or uncle. It's just spouse, parent, or child. But in order to use the FMLA's protections, you have to meet some requirements as well. And the FMLA applies to private employers with 50 or more employees and all government employers, so federal, state, and local employers. You also have to have worked there long enough, meaning that you have to have worked there for 12 months and 1,250 hours in the last 12 months that you worked for the employer. So we do have quite a few resources to help you navigate the FMLA, but I wanna just focus on something specifically here in the context of returning to work. The FMLA gives you up to 12 weeks of leave per year. So every 12 months, you get access to 12 weeks of leave. You don't have to take all 12 weeks off at the same time. You can use them in smaller segments of time, in some cases, even down to the hour, or you can use it intermittently. So this is really helpful if you're going back to work at the same employer and have access to the FMLA. You can tap into the FMLA's job protections and health insurance protections if you're uh, going to follow up medical appointments, or if you're not feeling well on a particular day, you can tap into the FMLA's protections. Now, the benefit of the FMLA is it does provide that job protection. It also provides health insurance protection. If your employer provides access to health insurance coverage, they have to continue that for the period of time you're taking time off under the FMLA. But the downside to the FMLA is that it's unpaid leave. So you have to figure out how you're going to bring in income during a time that you're taking off under the FMLA. And that means that you could tap into any accrued leave that you have, whether it's sick time or vacation time or PTO, or maybe even a short-term disability policy that you might have access to depending on how long you need to take time off under the FMLA after you return to work. Other than the federal FMLA, you might also be eligible to take time off under a state or county or even city leave law. So some states have state versions of FMLA laws that cover smaller employers. They also might have an expanded definition of family members who you can care for under that FMLA law. And then you might be in a state that has paid sick leave um, where you can use that to replace days that you're taking off work if you're not feeling well or for medical appointments. It's important to realize that these laws are all over the place based on where you live. So you can find information on these various laws on our chart of state laws. But in, in comparison to the FMLA, where you have to have worked there at least a year, meaning that the FMLA is really useful when you're returning to work at the same employer, state, county, and city leave laws might have different rules on how long you have to have worked for the employer. So these could also be helpful if you're returning to work for a new employer as well. So what are the legal protections when you're returning to your current job? So you can certainly use ADA's reasonable accommodations to help you manage side effects when you're returning to your current job. You can tap into FMLA leave or even state, county, or city leave if you have days where you need to take time off work for 
those follow-up medical appointments or ongoing treatment, um, or even <clears throat> if you are not feeling well on a particular day. But you also might be wanting to think about making specific disclosure decisions when you're returning to work. And we're gonna talk about disclosure um, later on in the presentation, but I wanted to put it here to help you think about those legal protections exist when you're returning to your current job. Now, if you have taken time off under the FMLA or as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, you have very specific return to work rights. And I wanna talk a bit through those for just a minute you have the right to return to the equivalent or same employment when you're taking time off under the FMLA. So this is very important to realize that under the FMLA, you have the right to return to work at your same job or an equivalent one. An equivalent has a very specific definition, which I've included on the slide, but basically it means it has the same responsibilities, pay, access to benefits, access to promotions, but it's not the exact same job. So if you're in a sales position, for example, maybe you have a different territory, but everything else about the job is the same. Whereas under the ADA, your return to work rights are reinstatement to the exact same job. So it's important to understand the difference if you're taking time off under the FMLA or the ADA. Now, when you're moving to a new job and returning to work, there are some key insurance considerations that you want to take into effect, into, <coughs> excuse me, to take into context. So first you want to check the benefits package of any new employer. Does it offer insurance like health, life, disability insurance? And if it does, then you want to think about which of the benefits are actually going to work best for you. And if you do take the health insurance through your new employer, you want to make sure that you're keeping any previous health insurance coverage that you have, like through your previous employer, until the waiting period for benefits at your new job is over. And under the Affordable Care Act, they capped the maximum waiting period for health insurance benefits to 90 days. So if you're not going to be eligible for benefits for 90 days, you want to make sure that whatever previous health insurance coverage that you have carries you through those 90 days. You also want to think about the fact that if they don't offer certain types of insurance, like life or disability insurance, if you had access to those plans at previous jobs, you can actually convert those policies to individual plans so that you can keep them moving forward. And if the new job doesn't offer you health insurance, it's important for you to understand all of your health insurance options to pick the plan that's best for you. And at Triage Cancer, we have a number of resources to help you do that. Now, the legal protections when looking for a new job are similar in that you wanna check the employee manual of any new job that you're considering and see which benefits and legal protections do you have access to based on the size of the employer, what state you're in. And we do have a checklist to help you navigate employee benefits during a job search. And then you can definitely tap into the ADA's protections and reasonable accommodations once you've actually received the job, but it can also help you during the application process. And that you might need access to an accommodation during the application process or those protections against discrimination. And then certainly tapping into those state, county, and city leave laws once you have a new job, if there are days where you need to take time off work. So turning to disclosure, we often get asked, do I have to share information about my medical condition with an employer or a potential employer? And the short answer is, you don't need to disclose information about your medical condition to an employer or a potential employer. But if you want to get access to some of the protections available to you, you might need to disclose some information about your medical condition. Because if you're going to ask for a reasonable accommodation or time off from work, you're going to have to disclose enough information about your medical condition so that the employer knows you're actually eligible for those reasonable accommodations or medical leave. But if you're concerned about sharing a cancer diagnosis with an employer, 
you don't necessarily have to share a cancer diagnosis if you're asking for those accommodations for medical leave. Because most of the time your need for an accommodation or your need to take time off work is actually based on side effects that you're experiencing from treatment. And it's those side effects that can be talked about rather than tying them back to a cancer diagnosis. And many of those side effects are medical conditions on their own, like neuropathy or fatigue um, or you know, any of the many things that come along with cancer treatment and the side effects that it creates. So you can choose which information to share or not share with an employer. We have a lot of resources to help you understand disclosure choices uh, at work. It's also important to understand that when you are looking for a new job, to return to work to, the timing is everything. So you want to think through if you're going to disclose your medical condition to a potential employer, when you might do that. A lot of people think that they feel an obligation to share their medical condition when they have a cancer diagnosis. And if you're not asking for any assistance, like through an accommodation or leave, it's not required. And even if you think that you might need an accommodation, we always recommend that people wait until they get a lay of the land before figuring out what accommodations they might actually need, because you might not know where you're going to be assigned or where your desk is or where your parking spot is, or that it's really the type of job that expects you to work 80 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week. So until you get a sense of the actual job and there's day-to-day -day responsibilities. It's hard to come up with all the accommodations that you might potentially need. So you might wait till you actually have the position and get that lay of the land before you decide to ask for an accommodation. So I wanna talk a little bit about medical marijuana for just a minute because this actually came up uh, just last week when I was speaking with a patient. More than half the states have passed laws that give people access to medical marijuana to help manage their symptoms from cancer treatment and other medical conditions, and 18 states so far have fully legalized marijuana use. However, it is still fully illegal under federal law, and so this creates an odd situation where state law and federal law actually conflicts and where people might think that they're protected under state law, but what they are doing is still totally illegal under federal law. And the reason I'm talking about this in the context of employment is that if you are applying for a new job to return to work and that job actually requires you to go through uh, drug testing for illegal drug use and you test positive because you have been utilizing medical marijuana to manage symptoms, it is possible that that employer has a zero tolerance policy, meaning that an employer would refuse to provide the job or withdraw a job offer uh, because of your use of medical marijuana. Now, some employees and potential employees have actually filed lawsuits arguing that the ADA requires employers to accommodate their use of medical marijuana. But so far, no federal courts have agreed, and there isn't a requirement under the ADA that employers accommodate medical marijuana use. However, there are a handful of states that in the state law, it actually prohibits employers from discriminating against employees for their use of medical marijuana. So there's an added layer of protection there at the state level that might be helpful. So I bring this up because we don't want individuals who are utilizing medical marijuana and applying for jobs to go back to work to be in a position where they don't get access to the job because they're testing positive on under those illegal um, drug use tests in the job application process. So we have more information on this issue in our quick guide and on our chart of state laws if you would like more information. So we do have quite a few resources related to employment on our employment resource hub on our website on all of the topics that I've talked about and many more. But I wanna talk for just a minute about transitioning off social security disability benefits. 
And those include the two benefit programs that are offered by the Social Security Administration. And they are Social Security Disability Insurance, which is SSDI, and Supplemental Security Income, which is SSI. Both of these programs uh, are long-term disability programs where someone has to have a medical condition that lasts at least a year or longer. So for someone who has been on disability benefits and thinking about trying to go back to work, oftentimes there's a concern that they might not actually be ready to go back to work, but they want to try. And because it's very difficult to get access to these benefits, it discourages people from actually trying to go back to work because the process was so hard to get access to these benefits to begin with. But the Social Security Administration anticipated that, and they have a whole series of programs called work incentives. And these work incentive programs include things like uh, vocational rehabilitation and job coaching and resume review services. And these are individualized support services to help people try to get back into the workplace. And so we've included the link here for the Ticket to Work program as well, and you can learn more about these work incentives. But one of the most important parts of these work incentive programs is the trial return to work period, where you get to be able to work nine months out of a five-year period to try to go back to work and to earn income and keep access to your benefits and any health insurance coverage that are tied to those benefits. So it is a very structured process where maybe you try to go back to work and you work for an employer for three months and then you realize that it's too much for you and so you come back to your disability benefits. And then maybe a year later, you can try again and work for two months. And so at that point, you've worked five months out of the nine months. So it gives you this ability to try to get back into the workplace and to continue earning money uh, and receiving your disability benefits. At the end of the trial return to work period, they're gonna look to see, have you been earning more than the threshold of $1,350 this year? Or has each month you've been earning less than that? Because if you've been earning less than that, we're gonna continue with your benefits. But you've been earning more than that, you enter what's called the extended period of eligibility which gives you three years after your trial return to work period, where any month that you earn more than that threshold of $1,350 a month, you're not gonna receive benefits. But in a month where you do earn less, then you will get benefits. And then after that three-year extended period of eligibility, then your benefits are gonna end. But if it turns out that Within five years from the end of your benefits, if you become unable to work again, you can actually apply for reinstatement of the benefits rather than starting the whole process over and applying from scratch for social security disability benefits. And this unfortunately can come up in the context of a cancer diagnosis where if someone is diagnosed with a recurrence, then you could come back to your benefits without having to start the application process from the beginning. So basically, this whole system creates a safety net to try to help people return to work if they think that they can. And then if it turns out that they're not able to work, they can come back to their disability benefits. So we do have a lot of resources on disability insurance, including the various disability insurance options and then how to navigate your benefits once you've received them. So that is available on our website.